Hello and welcome to another Skype interview with Talk Wildlife. Uh, today I'm following up on the Regua interview that I did with Lee um, earlier in the month um, because I want to talk about a very specific topic that astounded me when I talked about Lee and that is the hawk moths and the variety of hawk moths, the Garrett Regua. And with me I've got Alan Martin. Alan is a professional trustee uh, ex RSPB, ex BTO. He, he calls himself a retired accountant, but he's so much more when it comes to nature. Um, so, welcome, Alan. It's nice to meet you. Thank you. Uh, Alan is also somebody that has worked for many years as a volunteer at Regua and is the person responsible for two things. Number one, the fantastic list that we're about to talk about, but number two, an excellent book, which we'll talk about at the end. Um, so, how are you? I'm great, and uh, I'm delighted to talk about Regura and the wonderful biodiversity it has, and hopefully promotes more interest and get some more visitors out there if we can. Absolutely, absolutely. So, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to I'm going to share screen so we can flick through a few slides while we're talking. We can go as fast or as slow as you want on that. You just tell me when you want me to move on. Um, let, let's just introduce people first of all to Regio, so I'll, I'll have a couple of slides on that. And given that you know the habitat out there, I'll let you do that bit. Um, yeah. And then we'll go into talking generally about moths, and then we'll talk about a few of the moth species that um, you found at Regio, and especially the hawk moths. And you know, we'll talk about that final one that you've literally just discovered, uh, well, weeks ago not even months ago. Um, and then we'll talk about the book and also your plans for the next book, which is very exciting. So I'll just share screen if you give me one second and then we'll start talking about that. Right. So, Alan, first of all, if you could just give us a, a, a quick sort of background to just as sure. a reminder, really, to, to Lee's uh, interview about the habitat that we're talking about here. Sure. So, so Regua, uh, which stands for the Reserva Ecologica de Guapia Sioux, um, is a conservation project in the Atlantic forest of Brazil. When people think of um, tropical rainforest of Brazil, they tend to think of the of the Amazon um, and all the destruction that goes on in the Amazon. Well, far greater destruction has occurred in the Atlantic rainforest of Brazil which was a strip of forest that ran right the way down the coast from northeast tip down into uh, Misiones in Argentina. And of that Atlantic forest, only 7% uh, now remains. And the reason for the, that enormous destruction has largely been because of its location along the coast. Of course, it was accessible to export um, trees and, uh, um, and to change the forest into farming, but also something like 70% of the population of Brazil lives in that coastal strip along uh, uh, along the uh, Atlantic coast. So literally with 7%, only 7% of that forest remaining, the bits that are left are absolutely critical. And the reserve Ecologica de Guapia Sioux is one of the best remaining bits of forest in the state of Rio de Janeiro. Um, and the project was set up in 2001 to try and protect this specific, highly biodiversity rich area. It's about two and a half hours northeast of Rio de Janeiro. Um, and a group of people in the UK um, put some funds together to buy some forest and the project has blossomed since 2001 when we started. And we now own 24,000 acres of uh, forest rising from about 40 metres to 2,000 metres in height. So we have a complete altitudinal, altitudinal gradient. Um, and we've been restoring areas that have been cleared. We planted, I think, 550,000 trees now uh, to restore uh, forest areas and rejoin forest um, fragments. But in terms of biodiversity, it's far more biodiversity rich than the Amazon. The Amazon is largely flat, um, whereas the Atlantic forest has this huge altitudinal gradient, which anybody knows anything about biodiversity uh, knows is, is critical to the variety of plants uh, and therefore the species that live on those plants. 
Yeah, and, and thanks. That, that was a really good introduction. And congratulations for being able to say the name twice. I've not even attempted it. And I don't even think Lee attempted it in his interview. So well done for that and thanks. Um, so yeah, great introduction. And I think, you know, if, if people want to find out more and um, they can watch the, the video with Lee, uh, because what you'll find astounding when you do watch that video is just how by doing the work that Alan's just referred to, how wildlife is starting to move back in. It's astonishing that, you know, the species that are being drawn back into that area now, and it's a real credit to the work that has gone on over there, um, you know, that that's happening. So, and one thing that Lee did mention, and I didn't put up a picture at the time, which I will now, is the first ever moth wall in the world, according <laughs> to him. Yeah, <laughs> so we, it's the so first we, one in the world. Yeah, so we started off, um, we used to go out there and, um, of course, at night time, there'd be a huge amount of insects and praying mantises and all sorts of weird things flying around. So we started, because I do a bit of uh, moth trapping in the UK, we took a moth trap out, um, um, uh, uh, an ordinary um, MV light, and we used to put it on the side of the building. And, of course, we would get enormous number of moths and insects and ants coming in, but they would then go into the building as well. Uh, which wasn't very popular. So we had a brainwave and we created this separate wall set back from the building with its electrics. It's even got a nice little shelf on the bottom right hand corner. There's it's, it's a little shelf that you can put your you can put your beer on whilst you're out there. At the, <laughs> I at thought the you were going to see your trap. <laughs> <laughs> so so all it is, is it's just a wall with a roof um, because it does rain quite a lot in the Atlantic rainforest. Uh, an MV light um and on as you'll know in the uk you have good nights and bad nights and quite often if there's a bit of drizzle if it's overcast um you'll get more activity on the light and that's a that's a that's a good night at the uh, at our moth wall but yeah we think it's the first ever sort of custom built moth wall um uh, we might be wrong wrong on that, uh, wrong on that but it's um we're 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 pretty pretty chuffed with it, but of course, if you look at those moths, probably, I mean, we just don't know what moth species we have there. Um, there's probably unidentified species of moths on that wall, just as you can see there, some micros that haven't been haven't been described. But we wanted to start making an attempt at cataloging what species we had, because if you don't know what species you have in a in any reserve then you, how do you if you don't know what you've got how do you protect it or how do you understand more about their their needs and how important the place is yeah so i went down to a shop in rio to try and see if there are any books on moths or books on butterflies and i think they had a book on butterflies of pakistan but i couldn't find anything on butterflies or moths of brazil so we decided we had to try and do something ourselves yeah. So the first attempt was to produce some leaflets like this. This was a um, a leaflet on the on the common moths of regular. We did a similar one on butterflies. Um, we spent quite a lot of time down at the Natural History Museum in Rio de Janeiro, um, looking at the collection and trying to get names on on some of these things. And of course, there's quite a lot of web sites and web resources that you can use. But it, it's 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 pretty tough. Incidentally, the museum that we used to go to, um, was it three years ago now, completely burnt down. Um, so the entire Lepidoptera collection um, and many other species, spiders and various other things, has been completely destroyed, including all the type specimens. So this sort of work recording and identifying things is even more critical now. Um, the museum in Rio was the best natural history museum in the whole of South America. It was completely burnt to the ground, which is absolutely yeah, remember it's terrible, absolute tragedy. So, yeah. so we decided we had to try and do more to, if, you know, we needed to try and find a way of finding what we had there. So, rather stupidly, I decided that I would try and take a group, and I thought, well, hawk moths will be the easiest ones to work on, yeah, um, and produce a an identification guide. Uh, rather naively thinking that there probably weren't that many uh, hawk moths to start with. Sure. But, 
Before we move on to the hot moth salmon, can I just just I, you, I know that this is going to be an extremely difficult question to answer, but I, it'd be nice to take a stab at it. In this country, I, it always astounds people when I say, look, there's around about two thousand six hundred moths being mm -hmm. recorded in in the UK, um, which is an astounding figure in itself. But if you were to take a stab at it, um, number one, how many have been recorded? If you know that. Um, and identified. And number two, how many do you think that could go up to if everything was identified? OK, so I don't really, I, I can't give you good answers on that, but let me put it in perspective. In the UK, say there's two, you said 2,600 species of moths? Yeah, roughly? there's about 2,600. OK, so how many species of butterflies? Uh, 50, well, it depends, if you're counting migrants as well, probably about 57. OK. So in the Cerro dos Orgos, where we're working in Brazil, we've identified 803 species of butterflies. So if you consider a similar sort of uh, proportion, uh, and I've no reason to assume that that isn't, uh, isn't a valid way of calculating it, then there's a lot of moths, <laughs> an enormous amount. Um, yeah, that, that's incredible. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just, it, 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 well, you, you just, it's left me speechless. I, I just think, oh, wow, you know, my, my little trap, I'll go out there and have a look. Um, I'm looking at some of these pictures here, and it's, it's, um, some of them look really familiar. I mean, obviously, you know, a moth trap over here, so some of them look familiar. Um, there's one up there that's one, two, three, the fourth top one, um, from the left as I look at it with oh, this with tail. long tail that yeah. uh, that looks amazing how big is that um I suppose from the top to the tip of the tail is probably about 11 inches or so it's wow. that's a big moth it's a type of silk moth um yeah yeah it's pretty it's interesting that that quite a I mean a lot of the pictures on that you're showing on the screen at the moment are pretty distinctive you know they're they're yeah. silk moss with eyes and they've got spots and various things but a lot of the the more modest looking moths are very similar to the to the ones they're not the same species but they're very similar there's almost like a parallel evolution and you can look yeah. at them and you say well that looks like a magpie or that looks like a um you know whatever a wainscot or whatever yeah so it's, it's quite easy to to group some of these things into families based on an, a fairly simple knowledge of, of UK moths. Yeah. Um, and some look just remarkably, some of the prominent prominence you get in this country look almost identical to the ones we get out there. Yeah, it's crazy. And for those that um, have never been exposed to moth trapping in this country, um, He's not saying that there is a moth over there the size of a magpie. Um, there is, a, uh, there is. Uh, whilst the magpie is a bird over here, there's also two species of moth that are called magpie, the small magpie and the magpie. So just in case you're thinking, although, you know, nothing's impossible over there. So I think yeah, what if you, actually, if you go down, if, if you look at the one with the long tails that you mentioned, if you go four down below that, yes, one with the sort of curved wings. That's probably even even bigger. That's that's the biggest one on that page, I'd say. Um, real sort of sickle shaped wings, and that's probably oh, a good twelve inches from tip to tip, I would say. I mean, there, there there are some seriously large moths out there. There's one called a white witch moth, which has the biggest wingspan of any um, moths in the world. Wow. Um, uh, the the it's. The diversity again. A lot of if you talk to people who don't do moth trapping in the UK, they think the moths are all little little brown things. There aren't that many brown moths really. The, yeah. the yeah. detail of them and the colours are just spectacular. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, again, you know, you notice things like the the if you go from the bottom up to and then into on the right hand side, you know, very similar to our swallow tails. Um, you know, th there's a lot there that sort of do sort of replicate ours. I'll just have a quick look at the page before it as well. Um, you know, again, you know, very, very similar to our prominence and, and mm. you know, our uh, nutri tussocks and stuff like that. So, yeah, so extremely um, similar in sort of, you know, the look and feel, but clearly huge numbers. So let's come on to 
Hope moss. So hope moss. Uh, how many hope moss in this country, roughly? Oof, uh, you probably know as well as I do, but it's yeah, probably just... a, d- a, a dozen, I suppose, is it? Yeah, I'm counting up in my head. Yeah, around, I'd say no more than, definitely with the migrants, no more than about 15 or 16. Yeah. And that's with the migrants. So if we then saw, now, when I talked to Lee, the number I quoted, I think, was 76. He then corrected me and said, I was now 79. I know now, because we had a conversation beforehand, that there's now 80. So, oh, 80 yeah. species. Sorry, yeah, 80 species of hawk moth. So, let, let's just sort of talk a little bit about them. So, here we have one that's it's not sort of unlike our sort of lime hawk moth. Um, stunning blue underneath. So, what we'll do is I've just got a few slides here of hawk moths and if you just talk us through number one you know why the diversity um, and you know what attracts them to the area and just give us a little bit of background to the hawk moths themselves and then we'll come on to talk about the new one and your book. Okay so when when we started looking at um, the number of hawk moths in in the Cerrados Orgos we I say we spent a lot of time in the museum in in Rio and there was a um, an English collector I think about 60 years ago, who did a lot of the original collecting for the specimens that they have in the in the museum, in an area quite close to where Regua um, uh, uh, is. And in total, when we went through, we found there had been 110 species of hawk moths um, recorded in the Cerrados Orgos, which is the mountain range that um, that runs through the centre of Rio, in which Regua is located. Um, and there's another four recorded in the state of Rio de Janeiro that haven't been found in the um, Cerro dos Orgos. And if you look at the whole of Brazil, you're into 210 or so. Although the numbers are changing fairly rapidly because as people do more and more um, work, they're starting to split some of these species. Yeah. And they're finding that some species look quite similar um, are actually two separate species and other ones that look quite different are just different morphs of the same same species. It seems like a lot of the, the, the Andes seem to be a really important split on moths in South America and anyway I won't get into all the, all the detail but so there's over 200 species but my guess is there's probably going to be another 20 or so species added to the list over the next next few years as, as research goes on. Um, this the one you've got at the moment, this pink spotted hawk moth, is very similar to a convolvulus hawk moth that we get yeah. over uh, um, in this country. Um, this is quite a common um, uh, sphingid that is found all over South America. Um, and one of the more common ones, the ones you had the page before, Labrusca, Eumorpha Labrusca, I, I think we've only had, it's quite a widespread hawk moth in South America, but I think we've only had a couple of specimens at, at um, regular. Yeah. But so, yeah, so of the 114 in Rio State, I personally have trapped 80, that, 80 of those on that moth wall or, or very close to that moth wall. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is a, um, an interesting one. This is one that was split only about three or four years ago. Um, w- it's a very common moth, but it's and widespread across um, uh, Brazil. But it's now been split into three different species. Um, after I wrote the book, rather frustratingly. Oh, is by any chance that one and that one? Yes. So this, so these split. two were all under the same species, with Xylof- Xylophanes Pluto. Uh, no, not Pluto. Ooh, brain's gone. Um, but they were, they were, they were together, but now they're separated. Uh, the one before, Suarezi, has been named after uh, a guy who worked at the Natural History Museum, who uh, is one of the co-authors of the hawk moth book. So he actually got a, a hawk moth named after him, which I'm rather envious of. To be yeah, honest. too right. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> amazing. That's amazing. So that's a very common one. If 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 you come to regular and you don't find that one, then I will be uh, totally amazed. We've had it every month of the year. Um, so again, unlike in this country you'll have fairly fixed flight times it seems in um in at regular some of the species occur all the way through the whole through the whole year even though the climate changes quite a bit you have a hot season a, a, a you know dry season and a wet season some of these species occur throughout throughout the year and other ones have have much uh, shorter uh, flight periods yeah 
DNA. So, oh, this is just amazing. <laughs> yeah, this is quite a worn specimen, but um, it's it, people like this because it's the sort of colours of the Brazilian flag, really. This sort of green and yellow um, Ariba Cadini. It's quite a chunky, quite a chunky um, little chap. Yeah, yeah. Maybe they should adopt it as their sort of national moth. Yeah. Or yeah, even their... sure. yeah. <laughs> I, I quite like to be at the meetings where they discuss having a national moth. That would be quite... <laughs> <laughs> Well, what you need to do is get one of the football teams to use this in their badge on their strip, and away you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then bringing this up to date, this one is a sort of. I, I noticed on the website when I looked at this that it was March this year. Yes. So, could you, could you give us a little, little bit of background to this and, you know, the discovery of it? So I was, um, I've been going out there, well, probably twice a year now for 20 years or so. I think I've been just over 40 times I've visited regular because I've been, I'm not just doing the books, I'm actually involved in the project. So I help with some yeah. of the fundraising and various other aspects of the project. But I went out in March specifically to try and get some photos of some, butterflies that I didn't have pictures of to work on the, this this book that I'm uh, uh, working on at the moment. And whilst looking for butterflies, I found this little chap. This is a day flying uh, hawk moth called a Lopus Keculus. It's a bit like in the UK, we have one called the hummingbird hawk moth, which yeah. is a, a, a migrant that um, comes up and you can you can see it on Budlia and various, mainly in the south, but I think it does get quite a quite a way north in, in, in good years. Yeah. Um, this this one is actually laying eggs. It's sort of hovering over a leaf um, and and laying an egg on that leaf. But I I haven't I have certainly hadn't recorded in all my visits before. Um, it's not a very good picture, I'm afraid. But it's there's nothing like it there with this bright a day flying hawk moth with a bright orange hind wing. Um, it's quite a spectacular, it's quite small. It's about three inches from wingtip to, to wingtip. So, so fairly small. And initially it looks a bit like a hummingbird, to be honest, when it's it's sort of hovering over a leaf like that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's maybe been around a while and not sort of been noticed because people thought it was oh, just another hummingbird. May well be, yeah, so, may well be. So one question before we go on to talk about the book. Um, Again, it might be a difficult one for you to answer, but it'll be certainly a, a lot easier than the last one I asked you. <laughs> you've been going there a long time. You've been moth trapping there a long time. Do you have a favourite moth that's over there? Oh, dear. Do I have a favourite moth? Um, I don't think I'd, I... I don't think I do, and I, I think that whenever I go... that Well, I probably have a, diff, a different favourite every time I go out, because... The variety is just it's just so so immense and that, that you suddenly it may be a tiny little micro that you see for the for the first time that just blows you away when when you see the colors or the detail of it. And then another time you'll see one that you've seen before, which is with great big eye patches on its hind wing or or sometimes it looks fairly modest and it opens its wings and then then and then, you know, that they're just so much, so much variety. I, you you just can't have enough of them. And, and other times, I remember they put a new bridge across the river Guapiasu. This was a few years ago. Um, <clears throat> there used to be a rickety bridge. They put a new bridge across with quite bright lights um, a, along this bridge. And the first, at the end of the first week, uh, we happened to be going across it, and I picked up fourteen species of hawk moths by the lights on this bridge. Now, I was like in absolute heaven. I've, I've never, I don't think I've ever been so excited in my life, just walking and the, the moths were coming in and they were just sitting on the ground underneath these lights. So I was scooping them all up in, I had a great big container. I was putting them in so I could take them back and identify them and photograph them all. Amazing. But yeah, it, I was like a child in a sweet shop uh, and when you get a big attraction at the at the moth trap, again, it may not be individuals. It may be just the spectacle of the volume 
of the moths flying in and then you'll get a praying mantis comes in or you you'll get some tree frogs that are hopping up and trying to chase some of the moths or it's just the whole thing i love the whole thing so i can't have a favorite yeah 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 i i know that um the first time i saw green silver lines which um mm -hmm. If anybody hasn't seen one in the UK, they really need to go and have a look at a photograph and then it will convert them to moth trapping. And my heart went a lot faster when I first got one of them in my trap. Mm. Uh, seen pictures of them, but to actually see one in the flesh, so to speak, it was just amazing. I mean, I, I, I still get a buzz about seeing a blue tit on, you know, the seeds outside and in the feeders. Um, but to get something like that was just immense. I, so, guess, I guess quite interestingly, we most most people come out to regular are birders um and once you show them the moth wall all of a sudden they get hooked by the moth wall so whereas to start off with they'll be having a beer in the evening in the in the lodge and you show them the moth wall and they you know they'll be in and out checking the moth wall and it's usually the really big things that get people excited to start with because they've never seen moths you know plate sized moths they've never seen things like that so that that's what people get most excited about to start with I think and then and then they start they start looking at the really tiny ones and it just you just there's lots of people who have been who are birders who have turned a bit more to the dark side after they've been uh, yeah. <laughs> been looking at the moth wall definitely I mean you know you just again even in this country you look at some of the um some of the micro moths under a magnifying glass and mm. the patterns and everything just Oh, it's astounding. Uh, anyway, I, I will digress because I, I will talk about sort of moths all day because I do love my moths. Um, but what I want to do now is just sort of talk about your book, um, mm -hmm. which is this one. And I have to say as part of the introduction that um, this is not just a book of the moths of Regura itself. It's of the region, isn't it? So so it's this it's the Cerados Orgos. So Regura is in the centre of the Cerados Orgos. Cerados Orgos is the mountain it's the range of mountains that runs through through Rio de Janeiro. So it's a part of the what they call the Mata Atlantica, which is the the range that runs down the whole the whole hills. Um, so, so yes, it's a fairly limited area. But as I say, there's only another four species which I actually do talk about in the book that are found in the whole of the Rio of, of Rio State. Yeah. Um, so the book has. Um, it has on the right you'll see uh, one of the plates so i have in the in there male females um, above and below of each of the 110 species that are found in the uh, uh, in the area and you'll see some some pictures of uh, live specimens where at that time i had photos of i actually caught them I had photos of them so everything is covered uh, but the live photos are limited to to uh, to a lesser number. I've got a lot more photos now that I could add. Uh, add so if I do a, if I ever do a version two, then uh, they would go on that. Yeah, yeah, and I mean it, it does look. I haven't got the book yet, but it, it looks like an amazing book, and the pictures look, especially the ones, the the drawings. Who did the drawings for you? Um, these are photos of pin specimens. They're not drawings. Are they actually photos? They're photos. Yeah. So these, the so, these, so these are from the collection in uh, in the Rio, Rio uh, Natural History Museum. So uh, we we went through and we selected the best specimens to um, of males and females and photographed them. And then I spent ages with Adobe software tidying up all the backgrounds and making them all nice look, look consistent. The interesting thing is now all of this entire collection, as I said earlier, has been destroyed. So a lot of the photos I I have uh, of these collections are the only, you know, photos of type specimens and uh, are now quite an important record, really. Right. Oh, well, thanks for correcting me on that, because you can't really tell from the, the picture that I, I took from the website. Um, yeah. But now, because I, I thought Richard Lewington would be um, <laughs> worried. <laughs> wow. <laughs> For those who don't know Richard Lewington, you need to know Richard Lewington. He is one of the top uh, artists of wildlife in the world, as far as I'm concerned. But anybody that's got any of the moth books, he's just done the Caterpillar book, which is on my list. 
got to get it. Uh, amazing. So yeah, just quick tribute to Richard there. Um, right, I'm going to stop sharing screen now and I'm going to come back to you because I want to talk to you a bit more about um, Regua and also to talk about the new book that you're working on, which is also equally exciting. So just bear with me one second. So yeah, so the first, um, so our, our plan, long term plan is to try and develop identification guides to all the various taxonomic group, the important taxonomic groups. As I said, you, you, we, we need to understand what we're, what we have at our uh, reserve. But also, we're, we're, in the UK, citizen science is very well founded. So organisations like the BTO, organised bird surveys and butterfly conservation. Um, and there's a really good network of amateurs working with professionals. In Brazil, to some extent, it's, it's, it's not so well established. And usually it's the universities and university professors that do most of the work and they do their identification, not using field guides, but using reference collections that they have in museums. Um, but there really aren't many guides, books for, for amateurs to get interested. There's various websites. People can take a photo of a bird and put it up onto a website and somebody will come back and help them identify it. But we are regular, really keen, not just for our international visitors, but we're really keen that Brazilians learn more and can identify and we can generate more interest in citizen science amongst amateurs. Because if you don't get amateurs involved, you will never get good information on populations and distributions because the, the professionals can't do it all. Yeah. So we started producing field guides. And as I said, the first one was the Hawk Moth book. The second one that we supported was a book on the birds of the Cerados Organos, Cerados Organos. And then a Dutch guy called Tom Compier produced an absolutely amazing guide to the Odonata, which is dragonflies and damselflies of Cerados Organos. And he identified, I think, 204 species of Odonata in that area, of which I, th I think I'm getting my numbers right. Three are new to science, undescribed species. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and we're starting to get dragonfly groups coming to Regua now to, to see. It, it's made Regua the number one place in the world for the variety of Odonata. Now, there may well be other places that have greater variety, but they just haven't done the work and they haven't. Yeah. They, they haven't beaten us. Yeah. So the next obvious taxonomic group really to work on was butterflies. And I think probably behind birds, it has the most general public interest that people see and they and they recognize and they like butterflies. So we started working on a on a on a book. I started this one almost immediately. We finished the Hawk Moth book. Um, and we have identified, if we exclude skippers or grass skippers, which are a small, very difficult group, which we've set to one side, we've identified 803 species of butterflies uh, in the Cerados Orgos. There's 120 grass skippers, which we haven't included in the book. But this book here, which I'll hold up in front of you, this is, um, this is the... Um, <clears throat> the proof copy that I've had from the printers um, and this it's actually gone to print now so hopefully next week I will start getting the, um, the, the, the final printed copies back. And this book covers the 803 species with the exception of three um, all the species are illustrated they all have a description similar species distribution etc etc um, and I've done it in conjunction with a guy who works for us at regular called George Bizarro. He is the real butterfly expert and he is, he is absolutely top notch at his butterflies. Um, and what I've added really is the structure to put the book together. I've taken a lot of the photos, I've collected the photos, I've done all the editing, putting the book together. But George is a recognized butterfly expert uh, in the area. So hopefully when that's published, that's going to a make it much easier for people to identify and submit records and to yeah, generate greater interest in butterflies. Yeah. yeah. But I'm also hoping that it will act as a base and we'll start finding a lot more species that haven't been recorded before and we can actually start um, expanding the knowledge. And a logical next step probably 
uh, maybe in a few years' time, is to expand that book in to cover the whole of uh, Rio State. But at the moment, I don't know how many other butterflies that would... It would add quite a few that you find along the coast, which are yeah. different type of, 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 uh, of habitat species. But this was this proved quite a challenge to uh, to cover 803 species, to be honest. I can imagine. <laughs> Good grief. So, and I think what we'll do, if you don't mind, is when the book is published, um, we'll come back and we'll do a similar interview that we've just done. Who knows, it might even be out in the field somewhere. Uh, I wish it could be a, a regular, but that's not going to happen. I haven't got the money, but um, but we could maybe meet somewhere where there's butterflies uh, and talk. Um, and we'll talk about the new book because the number one, they look like excellent books for a start. But number two, the profits from those books go back into conservation at Regua. That's really important to say. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that, you know, we, I think we need to talk about the butterfly one as well as the other two that you mentioned. Um, also, on the website, there is various news articles about the moths, including the new one you found. Uh, you know, there is a section on the biodiversity at Regua. So highly recommend visiting the, the website and having a look around that. I will put links to it underneath the YouTube video. Right. So for now, I think if we say that's the end of, of part one, okay. we'll come back and talk again about the next Lepidoptera group, the butterflies, as soon as your um, book is sort of available. And who knows, we might even talk about the other two books and, you know, just keep broadening. And I think, you know, it sounds like an extremely special place. And, you know, there's some special wildlife there. There's a lot of work gone into keeping it a special place. And, you know, I think I think the more people that can visit it, the better because it generates those funds. And, you know, let's face it, a lot of people go there for the birds. But now that they know about the moths, mm-hmm. I think that that's going to be a huge draw. And let me just add that um, although we've been working on hawk moths and butterflies, we take photos of everything there. So we take photos of all the, the, the various moths. So that if at some future time we decide we're going to do a book on uh, on the moths, maybe maybe do silk moths or whatever, we have that database. And I encourage anybody who comes out to Regular to take all the pictures as well. And they generally will send them to me and I'm creating uh, databases. So if somebody, wherever they are, suddenly says, have you got any pictures of praying mantises, I can provide them with pictures. In fact, we do have a group who's doing some fantastic work on uh, praying mantises at the moment. We've got another group of students who are trying to work on a book on ants and I think they've found I think they're up to 400 species of ants now I'm not sure about you but I'm not sure I want a field guide to 400 black or virtually all black (laughs) black or red (laughs) very similar looking ants but um it's uh, the biodiversity is just shocking but whoever whoever comes out I can guarantee whatever they're interested in they'll they'll have a an amazing time but please take pictures of everything and in time we will we will produce books on everything i was going to say in my head i'm sort of stuck i'm thinking bees and i'm thinking beetles and i'm thinking mm. hoverflies hoverflies just right but for now <laughs> yeah we'll leave it at, at hawk moths so alan thanks ever so much i, I really appreciate your time Uh, Thanks for sharing that with us, because I know there'll be a lot of people that are interested in that. And I can't wait to talk to you about the butterfly book so soon. You'd be very welcome. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Alan. Thanks a lot. Bye now. Bye.